Hey guys, welcome back to the Jasmine Ortiz Show. I'm here once again with my lovely co-host, Jordi Polycarp. And today I'm actually live from Medellin, Colombia. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that real quick. So I'm on a Gira de los Medios. I'm on a media tour amongst a lot of the major television and radio stations here in Colombia. And it's been an honor to get to speak to a whole bunch of different people this week. And by the time this airs, tomorrow will be my birthday. So that's a little bit about an update in my life. <laughs> 30 second brief. Um, but to move into what we're gonna discuss this week, we're gonna do a continuation of our interview from last week with Aiden Smith. We had a lot to say uh, with Mr. Smith and the conversation was very interesting. So we decided to split it up into two parts. Today, our topic focuses on the value of music in modern society. So Jordi and I are gonna talk about that a little bit more in a second, but first, our Hollywood highlights. So I went to GovBall this past weekend. The lineup this year was actually pretty good. A lot of people have said that they don't love the GovBall lineup in the past couple of years. And as uh, some people listening might know, it used to be at Randall's Island, but it got moved to Queens and the Manhattaners don't like Queens, so they don't come anymore. <laughs> um, but this year, the crowds were awesome. Um, so many people were dressed in pink and I know exactly why. And it was to go see Chapel Roan. Pink Pony Club. And Pink Pony Club for sure. I don't know if you saw the clips and everything, but she was dressed as the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty came out of the apple. Oh my God. And, and yes. was smoking a joint and then, on stage, yeah. a giant one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then was like, Legend. she changed into like a taxi outfit later. Oh my God, I saw that too. All of her, yes. her band was wearing taxi outfits. Um, and like, if anybody's seen the clips online, when I tell you the crowd for this concert was huge for her show in particular was actually one of the biggest crowds I've I've ever seen. Um, I had to find my sister in it, and it did. It took a, a minute. I went from the side, so it was easier. But if I had gone from the back, I would have been lost, bro. It oh was my God. huge, which is crazy because she has managed to really explode in a fairly short amount of time for an artist like I feel like we always talk about and we know in general like artists take time to like build and for their labels to like market them the way that they want and things like that but I feel like people kind of knew who Chapel Roan was and then very quickly now everybody knows who Chapel Roan is out of um, nowhere with, it almost like, felt with an like album it was overnight, like a year old at is... this point yeah, which is crazy because I know, obviously, success never happens overnight. I've personally been following her for over two mm -hmm. years. I know you have as well, but I'm sure she was grinding mm -hmm. out her career even years beyond that. But it, this in particular, especially having known her the past two years, it feels kind of instantaneous. And I don't know exactly what the trigger was. Like, I know she had a very successful, I guess, headline tour for her album. And then some clips went viral on social media. I don't really know what else beyond that, but whatever it is, it's working. Yeah. I think she's a breath of fresh air. I think that, that we really needed somebody with her sound and like, she's so unapologetically herself. And I also think in the wake of like Barbie, like the Barbie movement, I feel like we've been looking for that kind of sense of community that she is building. Like if, <laughs> I loved seeing the, um, the videos of like, people dancing to her song hot to go at her concerts because it's just like like women and like non-binary people and queer people just kind of doing their little like teeny dance like trying not to hit each like other I feel like the fan base is so yeah I feel like the fan base is so like lovable and lovely and like supportive and everyone was just like so excited to be there and she's got amazing energy um the way she like jogs on stage like the whole crowd was doing the same thing like running <laughs> in place um i was like she just brings so much like life to everything that she does and i think we've been really needing it she's our madonna yeah so, and i'll take it i think she's fantastic i absolutely agree i think she's bringing camp back into pop music. And I think the last time we really saw this in a large scale is Lady Gaga, at least like to this degree. The 2010s 
Lady Gaga era, like meat dress, crazy front forward, like heels and geometric silver outfits. Like that was the last camp era we had in pop music. And then you have this high fashion era that's really emerged like with Beyonce, even Rihanna starting her own fashion house, having um, Dua Lipa, Olivia Rodrigo, Taylor Swift, just kind of having these very distinct styles, but also following mainstream fashion trends at the same time or setting the trends. We have not mm -hmm. had someone who's commit to a character in a really long time. And it is refreshing. Yeah. It's also she's committing to the character in a way that's not um, like frivolous, if that makes sense. Like all of her outfits, she gets like secondhand and like thrifts them and gets them cheap. And she feels very much like still just like a very normal like girl from the Midwest. Um, at the same time that she's able to like put on all these characters and her makeup team is amazing. I followed her makeup artist on Instagram. She's so good. Um, and like the way that she found her was just that she like dm'd her and was like i would love to do your makeup like i feel like you could have like this and this look and then she yeah. like joined her on tour and everything and it's so fun like it just looks amazing i'm like gushing about her but i'm like yeah, i'm her so NPR excited tiny that desk. we have this have you seen her mm -hmm. npr tiny desk performance mm -hmm. i feel like I that was almost the beginning of like this genuine mainstream push for her which is ironic because npr was typically seen as this sort of still independent underground vibe. But honestly, I feel like anyone that's on NPR is already basically famous. Um, <laughs> but her NPR special specifically was really, really cool because she did such avant-garde makeup. And I think that's what sets her apart, not being afraid to go there. Because I feel like everyone's mm -hmm. NPR set is almost the same. It's very stripped down, no makeup, normal clothes, acoustic instruments. And she went the exact opposite. She said, nope, I'm going to be a pop princess right here, right now. I don't care if the room is like four by four. She just did it. Yeah. She embodies it. Yeah. I, and I also like a lot that she has different themes for different shows on her tour for the fans to come out and wear. I think that makes it another level of interactiveness because I know if I was going to her concert, I would spend weeks planning that outfit and it's almost garnering the same thing as the Taylor Swift, like era's tour effect where people are spending weeks and months curating or crafting these looks. And it just adds to that level of fan engagement and dedication that an artist really needs to survive. Mm -hmm. I think she's really special. I think also, like, from what I've heard and read about how her career has been going, I guess, like, her and Olivia Rodrigo, either currently or previously, were signed to the same label. And when Olivia Rodrigo was getting a lot more traction, they kind of, like, benched Chapel Roan and focused on Olivia, um, which happens a lot. And I feel like, you know, we hear a lot about artists that um, come back a little bit later who were benched by their label or who were kind of like signed and then not really developed um and it sounds like that's what happened with Chapel Roan at least for a little bit which sucks when you're competing for that kind of like it girl spot Chapel Roan just kind of like snuck out from underneath that and was like actually I'm important too and like I'm worthy of listening to as well um and like did it in her own really fun interesting way so props to her marketing team and to her as well i'm like whoever whoever was the mastermind behind this i'm i'm taking notes for real i honestly think so much of it feels driven by her and her vision mm -hmm. just having seen her growth from a few years back to now seeing videos of her explaining how she's handcrafted some of her tour outfits it genuinely seems like a lot of this is coming from her and now that she has more resources and a bigger team her ideas are only allowed to get bigger which is really exciting and i'm looking forward to seeing what she does next yeah she deserves all of the praise she's getting right now moving on to our next topic this apple update has people saying all sorts of things about it um some people are freaking out they're like you've sold your soul to ai you're selling all your intimate details some people are just excited for the generative emoji feature so <laughs> it's interesting yeah it's been interesting to see what's crazy is i feel like different um 
areas of the internet, different corners of the internet are holding on to different things about it. And most of what I saw was um, people talking about how you can now hide apps. I saw it. Too. Or like, like the ways that you can't like search for them or they're in like a hidden thing with like a passcode. And every one of the comments was like, this is going to bring about more cheaters. They're going to start hiding grinder. I was like, that's crazy. I like, thought that immediately and when I I'm, saw I'm the sure. video. <laughs> when I saw the video, because I watched the five minute like Apple recap of all their new Apple mm-hmm. intelligence features. One of them that stood out to me was the fact that you can completely like erase an app from your phone, but then still somehow access it crazy. and then lock any app with a passcode. To me, I feel like the only uses for this are being shady and cheating cheating, or like underage kids yeah. getting on apps they're not supposed to be on. And I'm not saying, oh, oh, you didn't think of that one, huh? Yeah, that one is, that I one's worse. I didn't think of that one. Oh my. <laughs> I think that the feature. The Tumblr era. Yeah, 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 yeah. That feature is super dubious. It's a catch-22. Should technology be enabling us like that? Right. It's a it's a really interesting thing because I feel like I also saw people in the comments saying like if someone's gonna cheat they were gonna do it anyway exactly and I'm like that's fair but it kind of it reminds me of um did you see that documentary on Netflix about Ashley Madison mm-hmm. that like website that existed in like the two oh, thousands yes. basically um, for cheaters mm-hmm. yeah and and like the whole concept of like is it the kind of thing that like is it is it a service that people have been needing? I'm like, how many people suggested this or talked about wanting this that Apple was like, yeah, let me let me enable the cheaters and the scammers and the liars. <laughs> like, <laughs> how has society gone so downhill that we're suddenly okay with like an open market monetization of cheating? Like that right. is genuinely degenerate of, among many things. behavior for that concept to come back. All of it's like the modern, you know, phone era is kind of insane, but not surprising. It's weird. It's very interesting. I also saw, um, I guess there's uh, another feature where you can remotely control someone else's device or like another device. So um, I was talking to some of my coworkers about it, but we were talking about how if kind of like when like you're trying to get your parents or your grandparents to do something online and they're like I'll put it in the Google and they don't really know how to use it you can like control their device and do it for them basically mm. whatever it is I'm like I feel like that would be helpful at least because I feel like as technology evolves um we're still kind of like leaving some people behind mm-hmm. and at least being able to kind of like assist in a way and like show people how to do things um or like especially um like people who have like motor issues or like other like impairments that might affect how they operate their devices i feel like being able to use it remotely is actually a good idea that they can get more help for that that's really cool okay a positive we love that (laughs) here's another (laughs) positive that i like the gen moji feature just has me so gassed. I am one of those people. I'm like, (laughs) we've been waiting for this for years. Like there's so many random things that I need as emojis that I've always wanted to have. And I can't, like, I'm just so excited to see what it can do. Like alligator surfing, Mm -hmm. I don't know, pizza on an island. There's so many opportunities for interesting emojis to emerge. I love that that's where your brain went to first. You're like, what do I want to see? There's like other random regular things that just didn't have emojis that were weird to me that I want as well. But I can't mm-hmm. remember those regular things, only the ridiculous ones. That's fair. Pizza <laughs> on an island is actually really important. So thank you so yes. much for sharing that really thank vulnerable you. thing. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. I feel so validated. <laughs> so here's one that has oh, everyone God. like in, a, in the tizzy. So the reason that people are upset is because Apple has penned a partnership with ChatGPT, claiming that they're going to be protecting Mm -hmm. your data from the ground up, basically asking you for consent if and when you choose to enable ChatGPT on the phone to assist the Siri Apple uh, intelligence software to complete tasks. So one thing that the new Siri is able to do is engage in uh, 
problem solving, even if you're speaking somewhat naturally, or if you stumble over a word, or if you have a speech impediment. So I think that's a really cool feature because so many people, myself included, don't use Siri because it's virtually useless having to speak so robotically to get the point across. Now Siri is completely intuitive. So you can say, send a text to mom that says this, then you send it. The next message can be, tell her that we're getting lunch here. And Siri will remember who you were just talking about and send her a message about lunch at that place mm. without you having to repeat yourself. So that kind of thing's really interesting. This also works with how it scans um, your applications that you give it permissions to. So email, text, calendar, anything like that. It can combine that information and answer complex questions. So if you ask it, um, what time does mom's flight land? It can scan your texts and emails to see if you have a flight confirmation number for that day from mom, which is Whoa. so cool. That is life-changing. I am That's so scary. here for that. It's kind of scary, but I'm, I'm loving it. Like this is going to happen anyway. So for it to be useful is excellent. I honestly feel like if we're going to continue yeah. having cell phones in our pockets, they're going to have our information. They already do. And I'm not saying we should sign away like everything else. I just else. hope we don't get hacked. That's yeah, that's that's bad. <laughs> that is bad. It's just like like imagine, I, I'm looking imagine forward to the, and then in the same like remote control. Yeah, that that one scares me more than the email thing. Cause that yeah. is like that could really Well, I feel like they could use both. Yeah. Ooh, that's like a few ideas. <laughs> like imagine if somebody oops, sorry. <laughs> imagine okay. if somebody like like remotely gets into your device. And then is like, what time is Jasmine's flight landing? And they can find that information. That sounds a lot That's worse. That's scary. Said like that. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> Sorry. No, yeah, I mean... you're right. No, you're right. I mean, yeah. And then someone just shows up to MIA that I don't want to see there. Awkward. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, hopefully there will be safeguards against that. One other, <laughs> one other positive. Oh, this one's really, really interesting and somewhat controversial. The phone call recordings. Mm. So now you can record your phone yes. conversations and it'll give you a transcript and summary of what was said. Personally, I love this yeah. because I have had many a conversation where I would love to have been able to reference back exactly what was said and when it was said. That's all I have to say there because mm -hmm. whenever you have like a conflict over the phone, you're basically screwed. Like there's so much plausible deniability for the other person or yourself. And now both people that, are being held accountable. That's yeah. <laughs> the way that I've had, like I've had people specifically call me so that I wouldn't screenshot the conversation. Oh, I've totally like, done that I, too. I've so it goes both I've, ways. I've like tried to start fights. Yeah. I've like tried Ooh. to start fights and been like, look, we got to talk about this. And then being like, oh, okay, uh, let me call you. When it's like something that could low-key ruin their reputation that I have information on. Like, they'll yeah. always make sure they call me. This is one particular person. No, I'm I've done that too, though. Like, like, if I have something controversial to address with someone, I'm definitely not putting that in writing. You and call now, them? No, they're going to put That's that fair. in writing. Yeah, of course I would call them. But now the I feel like, I'm you know conceded. what they're doing? They're pushing us back into meeting in person. We're going to have to fist fight now. <laughs> Oh my god. Imagine. <laughs> We're gonna go back to the hair pulling. There's no uh, more cyberbullying. <laughs> crazy. I'm weak. Now we're gonna go back to the hit we're gonna be scrapping in the park. They're like have... you guys wanted more of a sense of community. I, I gave that community. to you. <laughs> we we wanted you wanted more human touch, right? You didn't say it couldn't be knuckles to your face. <laughs> sure. I'm into it, I guess. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. So well. I think that <laughs> I think that is going to fundamentally change speaking over the phone. Because I think people will be mm -hmm. way more apprehensive of it. But one thing that still cannot legally be recorded is FaceTime. Sorry. I don't think FaceTime That's can fair. be recorded. Because I'm pretty you know sure what I was thinking of? why. <laughs> what about like specific types of conversation? I know what you're getting phone. at. Oh my god, how are they going to transcribe that? Oh my god. Oh my god, indeed. <laughs> this is bad. Okay, my official vote for all of this is that overall, this is bad. They have so much access to... Because imagine, like, Apple also ha will have direct access, access to, to all, all of, of these things. 
Yeah. So remember how, like, okay, okay, now I'm thinking celebrities are screwed, right? Because mm. we've already had leaks of, of, of nudes and deep fakes and things like that. But imagine, like, somebody's recorded phone call conversation. Kind of like what happened with, um, like... Prince Charles. The royal family. Oh my yeah, gosh, Prince Camilla. Charles and Camilla. Ah. Like, because that was by accident. But imagine, like... On purpose, yeah. I don't know, dude. Or especially, like, because I feel like celebrities are, see, like, normal people who are not celebrities who will for sure record their phone calls. They'll be like, don't record. She'll be like, okay. Do you think it sends a... Does it send a notification if you're recording? I feel like it has to because there's a legality to it. So... Yeah, you'd think. But I feel like someone's going to find a way around that. Yeah, I mean, if they've been jailbreaking iPhones since the 2000s, like, I feel like maybe there's a way to get around some of the safety features. Mm. Hmm. Well, food for thought, everyone. Thanks, Apple. So (laughs) we're going to move into a quick commercial break before our next segment. Hey, guys, welcome back into our next segment. We're going to be talking about the value of music in modern society. So we're discussing this a lot more in depth a little bit later on in the second half of our interview with Aiden Smith, but I also wanted to share myself and Jordy's perspective on this from a personal aspect. So as far as how music has been devalued in society, I think that's something that you and I have felt, I think, incredibly personally. Mm -hmm. I think that it's been an interesting thing as an independent artist to see like or to really to get into the industry and notice how saturated it is and then especially we've talked about how like the emergence of AI and things like that and like accessibility for artists and I think there are always good things about it but I do also think that it does devalue what we do to a certain extent. I do unfortunately think that there is a push from record labels to devalue it to a certain extent. Like, they are realizing that they're dying a little bit. Like, record labels are a little bit of a dying art form because there's so much accessibility. So they're kind of hanging on to anything that they can. This reminds me, actually, I don't know if you saw, but um, the girl on tiktok who did the like i'm looking for a man in finance yeah trust yeah, fund yeah. blue eyes she has a record deal now and like that makes I'm me actually for... sick to my stomach <sighs> that literally I'm, I'm makes all me sick for people stomach. getting their stuff off the ground but what like stuff was there to get off the ground let's be so for real right now i'm sorry there's no sugar coating it there was no stuff to get off the ground mm. it was caca on the ground under someone's shoe. I'm sorry. I'm going to be so transparent. I don't know if this girl's a singer. I don't know if she's a writer. No. If she is. Congratulations. Yeah. But if not, no, absolutely not. Yeah. It was but a joke. But that's what's happening. It's crazy. And she said it herself. It started as a joke. And then, And what's like, she going to do now for the A bunch of different like, producers started doing? remixing it. Well, I think it's they're probably going to give her a 360 deal and like try to figure out what she could possibly do and that's what they do like all these influencers that we've seen have flopped in music careers because they're not musicians and this girl in particular from what i've seen isn't even like directly an influencer at least not the kind that we're used to seeing um and it just like it feels very weird and it feels like the record labels that are supposed to be pushing the narrative and changing pop culture and giving us artists that are supposed to mean something or at least so i thought are just kind of like looking for a cash cow um which makes sense because you know i hear about so many artists who get like denied from labels and they're like come back when you have this many followers and like that's what matters unfortunately um so i don't know it feels very weird yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. They are just looking for a quick return on investment, and the investment is little to none because if this person already has garnered attention for millions based on a viral clip or being an influencer, the record label doesn't have to put in the work to develop the artist. 
And that's the other thing. I don't know if this girl was an influencer. Wasn't it just a viral video or was she already building a platform? If you know. I think she already kind of was, but not, I don't think it was huge. Because to me, it felt like a comedian, like viral video that just one off kind of happened because it was genuinely funny. I think it was a cool concept. Mm -hmm. Like it was a great bit, but it's not a song. Yeah. Well, now it is. And that's, again, like, speaking to the devaluing you know what of I... music, because genuine instrumentation, vocal talent, performance, character is so overlooked. And I think that's also why Chapel Roan, to throw it back to the first segment, is so refreshing. It's clear she has an artistic mm-hmm. vision. It's clear she has talent. And without those things, there's just no room for longevity. Longevity. That's the main keyword. Yes, I 100% agree. Also, looking at this... So there was the original, mind you, this song now has 5.1 million streams just on Spotify. Um, And then there was another one with David Guetta that has 2.5 million streams. uh, (laughs) Like, and it's on, now count them, one, two, three, four, five Spotify editorial playlists. I really... We are quite literally it's, it's living really... in the feed. We are living in the feed. We're living in 1984. If our yeah. if our society is like allowing this to actually be considered music and put it mm-hmm. in places that are supposed to be highly esteemed, I'm... I, <laughs> where's the faith she in humanity? She got a co-sign from the producers. It's really like, if it was just her by herself, it wouldn't be a song. But the fact that like they cleaned it up, they re-recorded it, and like made it into a single i'm like it has the bare bones of what could have been a good song because i feel like especially with um like charlie xcx people say like returning to pop not that she had left but um with her new brat album and like the kind of music that is in the ethos right now i think we are looking for more like fun club type of music Mm -hmm. um and Go back I to think 2010s. That, <laughs> right. No, it's giving recession pop, actually. And I think I've seen so many people being like, I, I feel like we're headed towards another recession because of the way things are going. Um, but it really is like, <laughs> I, I think it has recession. the makings of what we, we you'd think, right? Apparently it's about to get worse. I don't know. Oh, so it's been good. Good. But fucking, my bank account is crying. Um, no, but I think like, there, it has the makings of the kind of music we kind of want right now and i think that that's what the labels are seeing and it's a smart decision on their part but also they could have just like made a new song that kind of sounds like this but better Mm -hmm. instead and then marketed that and and i I think that this one's gonna die very quickly yeah because just like any other flash in the pan trend it goes as quickly as it came and i think that yeah. will prove to be an issue because no one even knows this girl's name. They just know her from this song and video. Yeah. So then it's like, how do you build a brand off of that? So I, I will, we'll see if anything comes of it. I mean, maybe she's a hidden talent and she's an incredible artist and this is her big break. I mean, I that, that would be awesome. You know what I mean? But I just don't think that's mm-hmm. what this is. I so, don't see it happening. Yeah, we'll see. Um, and a lot of people have talked about maybe there's also a sense of like white privilege involved as well, and like you have to do the bare that, minimum. I, I, they don't feel like yeah. People are saying they don't feel like if a black girl had posted this that it would have gotten as much traction. Um, and I'm like, I think neither here nor there, bros, but I do see that happening a lot. I think it's because the finance bros thought it was hot. Like, they thought it was funny, cute, quirky. Yeah. Like, finance bros co-signed this, and it was, like, actively objectifying them, and they liked it. So I think there was some subversive, mm-hmm. like, flirtatious energy there that made it become what it was. And I think the finance bros are the reason that this happened. I mean, I think it's shallow I don't know. on purpose. It feels a little odd. Kind of like when I... Yeah, I, it's shallow on purpose, but I also think it's true. Uh, and I think that's why people are, are are liking it as well. Like, it's kind of like when I hear rap songs that are like... Uh, I don't know. Like, Shawty's a light skin, 5'2", good hair. Like, that's what that mm-hmm. sounds like to me. 
I see and it how that feels sounds. very uncomfortable. I see how right. that sounds. Yeah. So like it's it makes me a little uncomfortable and I'm like, oh, so not me. <laughs> like, and that's fine, because also I I'm not a man and this song is not about me. But it's also I don't know, it feels like a very weird part of our culture that like this like blue haired blonde white woman is like I'm looking for a, a blue eyed white man like and everyone's like yeah I, I think one thing is so fun I think one thing that is most poignant to me and I think has indirect ties to race but is maybe not directly related is the fact that it's really mm-hmm. pertaining to marrying quote unquote up socioeconomically and I think that's something yeah. that's so many people in our generation can relate to wanting because we feel so desperately stuck in place. And I think, you know, it's easy to compare our lives to the people who flaunt wealth on social media or celebrities or influencers. And seeing that lifestyle, you're thinking to yourself, who's the next normal sort of normal person that has that? A man who works a really good job. Mm -hmm. I think what the song is getting at is a desperation that our generation feels for not being able to have economic mobility. And maybe, oh. maybe that's a really deep unpacking of it, but I think that's why it's no, resonating with people. No, that was profound, and I agree, actually. I think that's why it's resonating with people, because honestly, the first time I heard it, I was like, go off, queen. Like, yeah, because who doesn't yeah. want to feel financially secure and set for life? I think that's what's so appealing mm-hmm. about the sound to people. What bothers me about it is not what she said. It's that it's quote unquote music. <laughs> yeah. But I also get what you're saying about like, the physical elements because i think that's where it got dicey you know yeah because like, i think that, that, that was already kind of general. alluded to but it's just like did it have to be explicit yeah. it's like i know what kind of man this is it's giving like it's giving every man that charlotte from sex in the city ever dated oh my god <laughs> like that's the that's the man we're looking for and i'm like i get it well she had like, one guy she sure. had one guy who was an electrician man in finance right she had that one guy he was a handyman he was great (laughs) indeed but she didn't even she dated him specifically because she just wanted a boyfriend no also because she just wanted she was like okay well apartment there you go yikes she was so real for that but also oh my god and then i'm like is this what dating is like sorry we're getting into so many different aspects it's okay that's what this is about but i do think it's it's an interesting like ethos like it's an interesting thing to see that, like, this is what our generation, like, clung on to. And it's the fact that we see some of our parents' generation and then a lot of our grandparents or great-grandparents' generation having had this life by the time mm-hmm. they were our age. And no matter what their socioeconomic age, yeah. class was, they still felt like they had a chance for upward mobility. It still felt possible. Mm-hmm. And now it genuinely feels virtually impossible to find that stability to even yeah. move upward economically. So then other people who are hearing yeah. this sound and thinking, this is my only way out to marry someone who with money. Like that's, I think, mm-hmm. very powerful and very real. In a world where we're also feeling so bad about dating apps, when dating apps were supposed to be the thing to like save us from ourselves and get us to connect and in, in the age of social media, get us to see each other and date and fall in love and it's actually making things worse yeah um i feel like we're also disconnected from each other and wanting to find something to hang on to i genuinely think the pendulum is starting to swing the other way and we do talk about this a little bit more with aiden smith later on in the episode but that sort of meeting in person thing is starting to happen more again because people are getting sick and tired of sitting at home waiting Mm -hmm. i agree I, and I do think we are on the pendulum swing, I agree. Because especially, even nowadays, um, in the ways that, like, social media plays an aspect, it plays, plays a role in that as well, we're seeing more apps geared towards um, getting young people to meet each other that are in strangers. Person. yeah. yeah. Um, like, yeah, like, I'm seeing, all, I'm seeing these apps that are, like, okay, you can find coupons or like free stuff for a cooking class or things like that in your area and a bunch of people our age are joining up and signing and then you get to meet people and talk and i'm seeing like uh, this particular app that does um dinners with like groups of strangers so you sign up and then they tell you day of 
where your dinner is going to be and then like you you get seated at a table full of people you don't know um and i'm like i i'm glad that things like this are being created because i do think that that's what we've been needing Mm -hmm. to a certain extent but it's interesting to see the role that it plays and like how it how it music and and social media connect to like what it is that we're actually looking for right and how our lived experiences have changed because i think one thing that hasn't Mm -hmm. been talked about a lot is how much people's lived experiences have been drastically altered in the past five years especially since the pandemic i think that just genuinely fast forwarded what was already going to happen in a really bad way so instead of Mm. you know the isolation and you know reverting back to kind of solely interacting with people online instead of that happening gradually over the course of the rest of the decade like it was probably supposed to it happened in one year it happened in two months really Mm -hmm. and then the repercussions of that we're still facing so either we were just barely Mm -hmm. out of our parents house still in high school in college directly post-grad whatever that means nothing was solid nothing was stable for us so then having this lack of in-person community all of a sudden just exacerbated any mental health problems that were probably there in the background already i think that also adds to the fact that we in the ways that we've been trying to build community live shows are also a huge part of that Mm -hmm. so it's just it's crazy (laughs) well we we talked a lot (laughs) We're going to go into a quick commercial break before our next segment. Hey guys, welcome back into our next segment. This segment is where we talk about our topic of the week, which is music's role in society. This is a topic that was crafted and curated by Aiden Smith himself. And we're going to talk about how streaming has fundamentally changed how we as a society hold value for audio arts. So what do you think of that, Aiden? Uh, I think you said it so person perfectly in that introduction right there, which is if I ask you who's listening to this and uses Spotify on the daily, like how do you value music? You want to say, oh, I value it a lot. I think that it really matters. It's super important to society. But if then I ask you like, okay, how much would you pay for it? The, the answer changes. And this is this is no hate on anybody who uses Spotify or a streaming service. Like that's the world we live in. It, we are pri- we're optimizers. We want to find something that's the best price solution and all these things. But this idea that you can pay a flat rate for access to everything that has ever been created is is crazy. And at its yeah. at its core, it does devalue the art form because you have access to everything all the time and everybody has access to that distribution. So this marketplace is flooded with art of various degrees of quality and the consumer makes no price differentiation between any tier of art and the consumer also has no tacit understanding of the cost of that art like if i say what's a banana cost you'll know kind of what a banana costs you're like yeah it's not more than a dollar for a single banana it's probably like you know 30 to 50 cents spitball still in san francisco bananas are cheap that's a that's (laughs) a topic for a whole other thing there's a reason bananas are cheap but bananas will always be cheap But if I ask you, like, what does it cost to stream a song? That's a hard question to answer. I feel like most people would be like, I have no idea because Or what does it cost to create a song? Yeah. That's another element. And I think that's a huge part of the conversation that's lost on the average consumer. Because even the CEO of Spotify was quoted saying the cost of creating content is close to zero. That is an incredible slap in the face (laughs) for the hundreds of thousands of individuals that quite literally create the content that allows this platform to exist. So that is also over Spotify after Spotify reported profits of over $1 billion. Yeah. 
all the while removing the ability for songs with under 1,000 streams to monetize on the platform, which goes against all the principles of performance and mechanical royalties that were established in this country. The fact that Spotify almost acts as a tech company in a way, because what they're really providing is a platform, an application, um, a user-friendly interface, so to speak, oh, where yeah. one can listen to music, craft those playlists that relate to them, um, you know, sort of what you would do on a mixtape back in the day, an analog, but what else are they truly providing of value besides the monopolization of streaming content? Yeah. It's unfortunate to see because I think that the main thing is they not I was gonna say big music. Like <laughs> that's legit. That's legit. There is a big music. That's so legit. And the craziest thing is it isn't just the labels anymore. Yeah, no. It it's everything. Big music <laughs> really wants to keep consumers in the dark about what it actually takes to create that music because they want to be able to undervalue it so they can keep making money off the artists themselves while the artists make next to nothing but they know they will continue to do it because in their souls they need to keep creating art and i think unfortunately when it comes to how to value it I don't know if we'll ever be able to return to what it was before because I think that now that they've made things too accessible to us, it's kind of like like buying a book. Like there's a specific, you know what the price is yeah. and you know you can't necessarily get it anywhere else. But you could also just like go to the library with your one library card and read them for as long as you want. And maybe an extra fee to take it home and things like that. And I feel like that's kind of how our world likes to handle things. Like everything is subscription based. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about how that extends to the film industry as well. And mm -hmm. how people see Netflix and Hulu and the ways that... And also Oscar noms as well. Yeah. Basically like netflix only movies that did not have a theatrical release there was a huge controversy whether or not they're sh they should be uh, applicable for oscar nominations mm -hmm. i think they absolutely should be because they are also art created in the same long form um but that was a whole thing because then it's bypassing the theater structure entirely yeah, yeah, That's yeah. True. so this streaming bubble is is gonna burst uh, Netflix for the movie and that they like Netflix is the only profitable streaming platform. Really? Yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, it's there the are, oldest. it is well. the oldest and they produce their own content. So mm -hmm. like Netflix is pretty much only their own content. Uh, mm -hmm. Disney and Hulu are one and the same. They are mm -hmm. owned by Disney both. So then the only other player is really like Paramount or HBO Max, but HBO Max is also, I think, owned, but anyway, I'm not going to conjecture. They're I don't know for sure. And they're, they're all conglomerates. They're all conglomerates. But same thing with, with Spotify. Like that model is not really that profitable. Like there's, there's going to come a time where it doesn't, it doesn't do the thing anymore. Mm. I don't know. I What's don't know. that going to look like, do you think? Well... I can tell you what I'd like it to look like, or I can tell you what I think it might look like. I can tell you both. both. Which would I both? I'd love to. Which should both. I start with? Uh, what you would like me... it to look like? Yeah. What I would like it to look <laughs> like. So, I think that what Spotify has done a really good job of is they've done a really good job of curating music, and I think that they should continue to do that. I would I would like to see a world where Spotify exists more less as like a this is where you go to get all your music and more to, hey, do you want a playlist that's perfect for you? Do you want a playlist that's perfect for your kickback? Do you want a playlist that's perfect for your beach day? We have that curated playlist. I would like to see Spotify in that realm because I think they've done a great job with that. Like I love my Discover Weekly. I love my Release Radar. I love my curated mixes that Spotify does because they get to track all the stuff that I listen to and they've done a good job of like figuring out what songs play well. Like, oh, if you like this, you probably like this and this. I think they're good at that. I think that they should keep doing that. I think that that is something that is good for the industry as a whole. So I would, that's how I would like to see a place like Spotify play nicely. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would like to see 
is it's weird that we have we have like a fake marketplace for music because it's not profitable it's not it's not a marketplace it's not profitable it's exactly it's not a marketplace for a couple of reasons it's not profitable you don't get any control over what your price is uh you can choose to only give your song to certain providers but nobody does that so every provider is basically the exact same. That doesn't make sense to me. Why is there Apple Music? Why is there Spotify? Why is there, I mean, Bandcamp, I love Bandcamp. That's a special thing. But it's, it's, it's weird that there's all these different places you're supposed to put your music. For what? For why? It, yeah, it's the opposite of what we just described with um, with film, because like you said, Netflix has mostly originals. HBO has a lot of originals, and they also have to license things to yeah. hold them on the platform. I don't understand why there's just this blanket music license being applied to all of the DSPs instead of like them being required to pay something we pay them to right. distribute our music What's, which is I in will fact, say, you have to i will say i'm at least glad that uh spotify from what i understand and how i've used it as an artist is one of the only if not the only uh streaming platform where any independent artists can get their songs on an editorial playlist because the other ones have you kind of jump through hoops and like it's mostly through networking and who you know and things like that in order to get your name on an actual playlist but spotify is the only one where artists and or their teams can directly pitch their music to spotify and they will look at it yeah so i'm at least glad for that i feel like it's one of the platforms that allows for more discovery in that way whereas i feel like Apple Music and Amazon Music and things like that. Don't... Those things are very one-sided. Yeah, they are. Ex they are exclusively focused on profit and not that much on the user experience or the artist experience. From what I, Man. from what I believe, which I think is why Spotify is number one mm -hmm. in the industry right now. But at the same time, that provides an issue because if Apple Music and Amazon cannot really theoretically compete because the functionality is entirely separate, we don't have anything to challenge Spotify to make the rates more equitable, to make their policies more fair. The fact that they just removed the uh, monetization for artists with streams under a thousand is I think obscene. Mm -hmm. And you could you could argue that maybe you shouldn't be able to withdraw if it's less than a thousand streams because realistically you're maybe making five dollars or less yeah okay maybe you have a certain dollar amount you need to reach to withdraw from the platform but at the same time you should still be able to monetize your work regardless of the <laughs> amount that you're getting because does it just mean that it doesn't start counting until after a thousand streams yes because they want you to market yourself better so they make more money yep. off of you youtube it's does exactly, the same and they thing they want you to pay spotify for marketing campaigns yes. which you can also it's do new everything yes, it's just adding... like yes it's just like tiktok and instagram now you can pay for sponsored spotify campaigns that is true just like google ads just like instagram and tiktok mm -hmm. campaigns but only if you have a certain amount of like streams and and like monthly listeners and stuff like that and not only that, that i've also that heard i've heard from other people like on sort of on the inside of like that part of the industry that the curated spotify editorial playlists are getting so much fewer so much less traffic now that the AI DJ has come about because mm. people have been more interested in seeing what the AI DJ has to curate for them than the pre-curated editorial playlists. So even that's becoming a little that's bit less so valuable of a resource. That is really interesting. Yeah, I have I have a bunch of questions for you guys, actually, if I okay. can turn awesome. around for a second based no, on everything we just said. I'm gonna start here of like, this is two parts. How many fans do you think you need or in an ideal world, how many fans do you think you should have to have to be successful? I'm not talking about Malibu LA successful. I'm talking about, I'm an artist and that's my job. How many mm. fans you're, do you think you're is living fair? off of it? You're living off that. Do how you many mean, fans? My question to you is how do you define fans? Do you define them as followers, as monthly listeners, as streams, or as people who will show up and buy tickets? That part. Ah, so the second half of this question is we, we spent a lot of time talking about like, how do I get discovered on a platform? How does that 
whole thing work. I have to pay the Spotify campaign and I have to pay you to get on an editorial playlist and yada, yada, yada. What do you guys feel like the role of live music is in this? What do you feel like that looks like? For me, to answer both of those questions, I think it's all about the conversion rates because you can have quote unquote fans who like follow you and who see your stuff or who might listen to your music, but then are they actually engaging with you? And that's where you kind of have these like different segments of audiences, Um, at least from what like we've learned and especially in like our like music marketing classes and things like that the ultimate goal is always the conversion rate. Like you can start with brand awareness and like having people see you, but if they don't actually care to take those next steps, how much of a fan are they actually? So for me, I feel like, yeah, what's up? Conversion rate to what? Like, like, sorry. Ticket sales and profit. Money. Yeah. They have to To spend their money. Ticket sales and merchandising essentially. Yeah. Yeah, because that's how we make our money, right? Because we don't make anything off streams. I mean, unless you're Beyonce level, legitimately, you cannot survive off of streams. Right. No, incredible for me of like how many fans I want. I want enough fans to sell out a medium sized venue in New York. That's I, I don't even know how okay. many that would be. But like any of the like slightly smaller stages of the concerts that I go to that are like 40 bucks. I want enough fans okay. that every time I'm in town somewhere, that show gets sold out. Okay, mm-hmm. interesting. So I'm hearing like we want, assuming a third of fans would go, mm-hmm. we want a thousand fans in a given city. Yeah. Okay, and that there would be is enough for me. So if I were to ballpark a number of like fifty thousand fans, mm-hmm. does that sound reasonable? Is that like yeah. hey? That because should be enough. If 50,000 fans are... Legitimate fans, yeah. Streaming my music on repeat. So going through my catalog, they like listening to my music on a regular basis. They are buying the merch. They are buying some of the songs, if, if they're the kind of person who will actually directly buy them from iTunes and things like that. And yeah. they are showing up to the shows. Because for me, it's also about that connection like the my reason for making music is not an ego boost. I want to see those people and engage with them. And it doesn't really mean much to me if they're just kind of like seeing my post and going, "Oh, that's cool." Scroll. Like yeah. I want engagement it feels so on a hollow. human level. Yeah. It feels very hollow and empty, I think being an artist in this day and age. Um what were you going to say? Can I so speaking to both of the things you just said, I you asked me, I kind of never answered the what I think might happen question. Mm. And I want to answer that now, which is there is this weird thing happening. AI is getting involved, right? We have these AI DJs. We have this AI music that's awful, but it doesn't have to be so bad. And I really, I see this world where Spotify becomes almost untenable to be on because all of the art that you will be fed is not real, hmm. has no that substance. Is so dystopian. It is, it is so dystopian, but, but, but don't, don't lose hope because you know, the indomitable human spirit, right? Like we will not be cowed or accept that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I hold a very special place in my heart right now for music venues. And for live music venues, especially those like underground clubs, those like 200 cap places, because what I think will be the response is that like, man, everything on Spotify is awful. I crave that genuine human connection. I crave art that makes me feel something. I crave a relationship with an artist who I uh, think that their view of the world is beautiful. And I think that that like, the, those spaces will become so essential. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. So I just think that's something that's generational for us though, too, because hmm. I think we in our age group are some of the last people to have grown up without 1000% exposure to technology. Mm-hmm. And we do kind of long for the simplicity of our childhoods a lot. I know I do. And, and the thing is like, I, I think so many of us in this digital era 
uh, feel insanely disconnected from each other. We are constantly craving that genuine human connection. I mean, you see the rates of dating and marriage in our generation are exceedingly low than like the generations before us, at least relationships be being successful or meeting them in physical in-person settings. And the rates of depression and isolation and, you know, mental health impacts after the pandemic especially are exponentially higher in our age group and the age groups below us because we've been insanely isolated, you know, for the past decade, I want to say, on and off. Mm -hmm with technology. Yeah. So I think this reversion back into the physical space is important. And there's been studies conducted that people in our age group and millennials are doing sports clubs and hobbies and trying to meet people in the real world doing those things because it feels like it's impossible. Yes. Yeah. And at work, if you're working from home, where do you meet people? Legit. I work from my apartment, like literally sitting right here. I'm not going to meet anyone sitting right here. So I have to force myself, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think our generation in particular is very much craving human connection for a lot of reasons. And I think, you know, like we're in our 20s, like Gen Z right now is mostly in their 20s and like a little bit in their 30s and a little bit below us. But most of us are in our 20s and, it's, and we want the early 2000s back in particular because that was our childhood and even to the point where like gen alpha as well is like we i think we they talked about this on an, on an earlier podcast so sad but they're also kind of realizing it because they want human interaction as well and things that we used to have and what people are looking for is that i feel like there will always be um a push and pull in our society between extremes of things like whether it's politically or like technology wise i feel like at the same time that ai music sucks but also is really good and really funny in a lot of ways like i feel like it has its benefits as well yeah there will always be people who want live music and who want things written by humans because you can tell the difference in the same way that like we get uncanny valley and things like that oh i think God. and the, even to the point where ai can't make hands and things like that if even if you're not quite looking there's a look to ai art and we were talking about this um last week with vita and oh, cool. like i think there's in the same way with music you can hear it even when i'm not quite sure and it like pops up on my tiktok feed i'm like something about this sounds wrong and the reason why is because it was not crafted by a human. It just doesn't yeah. quite understand what we want. The and it's nuance. also not innovative. Like exactly. nothing ever it, it only exactly. draws on the source material. Yeah. yeah, it can't innovate. You're right. It's nothing new. It's not interesting to me. I'm like, I've heard this We were this talking before. about this with Vita. Um, and one thing that they said that really popped into my head just now was when photography first came out, painters thought their lives were over. Mm -hmm. Their jobs were gone they would never paint again but we just learned to adapt and even use photography as a tool in painting yeah yeah and i think i hope that this will serve us in the same way that instead of ai quote unquote replacing artists we can use it as a brainstorming tool mm, i think it's at least to me akin to a random word generator which is something that was completely non-controversial to use in songwriting since the dawn of the internet and word generators so i yeah. think it's just a step beyond that and now it can give you a melody now it can give you a concept mm -hmm. do you want to take that verbatim absolutely not, not. No way. but do you are you able to adapt that into your own style and maybe forego any writing blocks that you might have had yourself i think that could be a valuable tool mm -hmm. i agree i agree i'm i am basically unafraid of ai and technological evolution like i'm a I, there's a word for it i think i'm a techno optimist i believe that we will solve <laughs> all of humanity's You're problems an early adopter through technology i am but truly no it's just it's always going to be another tool like that's all it will ever be is a tool for people to use and mm -hmm. yes there's always losers when a new technological innovation happens. Somebody gets hurt. Somebody's like, what I do specifically me is better done by something else. And that is always painful and tragic. But like, by and on large, I'm not scared of this technology decimating the entire industry. Like, no, it's just going to be a tool. I, I think you're spot on with that.
Yeah. Do you think there'll be applications for AI usage in audio engineering specifically? There already are. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, yeah. Lander, for example, came out years ago, like four or five years ago, and is a automatic mastering tool. Actually, emastered.com also does that as well. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's some cool, cool tools that are evolving. Uh, I can't talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Apologies. Um, oh, yeah. No, like it's coming. Absolutely. It's any and process. It's here. it's here. Any process that can be easily automated is going to be automated. Uh, I mean, think about it like how, you know, in the 60s, we would have to record on physical tape. Mm -hmm. Cut, paste, cut, paste, legitimately move the tape obviously no one in their right mind would want to do that process voluntarily unless it's for a, a nostalgic project or something right. like that so i think it's going to be the same sort of thing i mean we don't even have mixing boards really in studios anymore mm -hmm. i've seen giant touch pads in studios that are acting in place of a physical mixing board and then when a studio has a physical mixing board it's a huge flex yeah you know it's like wow we're cool enough to have this tablet and a mixing board <laughs> but you don't have to use this old thing if you don't want to yeah no nope. you know? yeah so i think it's the same thing i feel like as long as we're using it responsibly and like the companies who are integrating it into their systems are using it in a responsible way i feel like it can only be helpful in the same ways that like um like isotope yeah. They're kind of like mixing uh, software has tiers. So the first one is just this like basic AI one. But then as you add on to tiers, it starts taking in more of the actual programming from software engineers and from audio engineers. So at the same way that they're like monetizing it, I'm also kind of glad that they're putting the pure AI version as the cheapest because they're like, this is what you could do. And it's what's accessible to you as an independent artist or as some as a producer. But if you want more detail, more work put in from real people into this preset, then you're gonna have to pay for more for it. If you want yeah, the that's full nice. experience, you have to pay even yeah. more for it. Because it preserves that human element of like, yes. there is still a human that touched it and that's what makes it better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Can I? Yeah, that's. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to ask one question. Uh, still yeah. on the topic of like innovation and tech. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about like five point sound and like Dolby Atmos and things like sure. that? Sure. Uh, is there something in particular you would like to know? No. <laughs> Just have you or have you? Do you guys like work with it at all at Lucas or like how how much experience do you have with it as of right now? Right now, oh, what a has lot. I been like? I, I feel very, very confident in these arenas. Uh, so the the industry and the music industry as well, it's not a, just a film thing, is basically an Atmos camp. Mm -hmm. uh, Atmos, for those who don't know, is a 714 format for the most part. It 712 and basics, and there's lots of configurations. But you have a full array of surround speakers, and then you have some overheads. So the theory with this is that I can take a sound, think of it like a mosquito, and I can put it anywhere in the room that I want to put it. So if I want you to hear the mosquito right here, you'll hear it. Or if I want you to hear it right here, you'll hear it. That is Atmos. It's made by a company called Dolby, and their real secret sauce is encoding that data to say, if you want it right here, it needs to hit this speaker and that speaker and that speaker and that speaker at this percentage. Mm -hmm. So that's the magic of Atmos. There are other competitors in the music space. There's Sony 360, they're a big one. Their big differentiator is that they have a floor channel. So you can kind of get this like midline, uppers, lowers, giving mm. that spatial interpretation. There is Aura, which eh, we're not even gonna get into, but there's a couple of competitors, <laughs> but essentially it's all Atmos these days. Everything that's less than Atmos, 5-1, like you just mentioned, which is just a left center, right, left surround, right surround speakers. All of those tend to be down mixed from the large thing. So you take your largest format and then you do some math and basically create the lower format mixes from that upper format mix. Mm -hmm. And there's varying degrees of how well you can do this. The most human 
people choose to do it by actually creating a new product for each each step. Yeah, it's big in music though. Immersive is the future, but the problem is, right, here's the rub. Nobody listens to it. Like, mm. nobody is like, ah, yeah. yeah, let me listen to this new album. Check out my 10 speaker setup in my right. living room. <laughs> <laughs> like extremely few people have that more film buffs have it because it's been a film thing for longer mm -hmm. but even that how many yeah. people do you know who have a private theater in their home with that many speakers it's not going to be a lot of people mm -hmm. so there's this, kind yeah. of this interesting thing where everybody's pushing towards this immersive environment to what end like most people are still consuming on their headphones i feel yeah what's up i think more music venues should use it. I think that's a good idea. They I are think that would, wow, seriously, that would improve sound and some so are. Much. I think that there are like some venues put a lot of work into creating these immersive experiences and making that their norm. One example is National Sawdust in New York. Um, for I still haven't been, but I've always heard a lot about how much they put into their sound design. And they have like artists, like music artists that do artists in residences or like putting um, like their album release parties in this kind of space. And it's always sound immersive in that way. And I think music venues are seriously missing out by not doing it. Cause I think that's really what we want, especially when you have so many people in a space just having these speakers coming at you above and down, like coming this way and forward, I feel like it's fun, but it's overwhelming. And I think if we could make the experience a lot more surround sound, it would make live music so much better. I tend and to I think agree. this goes for clubs too. And like listening to a mix when you're on the dance floor, mm. I absolutely loathe how most of the clubs in Miami distribute music or play music through their speakers it's at an obscene level first of mm -hmm. all like i mean absolute hearing damage level and then beyond that like the mix is completely muddy because you're just hearing it at like you know a, a two thousand percent volume and it's not it's not doing any of it justice and it works for certain genres like edm you can say okay like if you really want a heavy low end like you can just boost that and just have everyone like feel the rhythm and that's fine but i just don't think it does anything justice no i agree I, agree I i totally agree it, you can't it's clubs aren't for enjoying the music and but they could be they, they really I could mean, be. i think they, they would just to add be. to the experience be. because it would make people want to dance more and therefore spend yes. more time there and spend more money there I, the other I think, thing go ahead no you go i was gonna say one in particularly common experience I keep hearing from people at the who go to the clubs and seeing on social media is that no one's dancing anymore and people mm -hmm. keep being like why is nobody like cutting a rug right now and I, I feel the yeah. same I feel like when I go out I'm one of the only people I see like genuinely dancing and I think the reason why is because our music scene right now is not creating danceable music as much and we don't have the sound systems if i went to the club and i heard like 2000s sean paul in dolby atmos i would, I would go crazy my mind. i would go crazy i would lose my mind and i think oh we are seriously i'm calling it now if any venues are listening to this podcast if they want to survive and or want to give us money for this idea if nobody's had this yet i will we'll even make it for you think, yes i genuinely yeah. think there's so much human experience that we are missing in these little details and if we're talking about we want things to breathe again like we want our technology to feel more human and to have more human experiences i think music and sound curation and experience curation is the number one way to do it and i think we already want it and if they will just give it to us 
they will make so much money and we will be so happy. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think you're so spot on. I would, if there was a club near me that said they did an exhibit once a week where I could go and it was like an Atmos thing, I would do it. I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I would love yeah. to be there. Yeah. As far as like in general, live music at a larger scale, we've been talking a lot about the Live Nation lawsuit and that conglomerate situation between Live Nation and Ticketmaster, mm -hmm. how that was even allowed to exist. Um, and now all the sanctions that are being pressed on them by Congress. Uh, but specifically with how there's beginning to be lack of accessibility to live music, especially because the price point has been quadrupled in the past five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we mitigate this when artists are genuinely relying on that ticket sale to survive at any level, genuinely? Um, how do we mitigate that when we don't know what the overhead is for the ticket company? What are they taking versus what the artist is taking? So, That's not even been transparently, I think, discussed. Mm -hmm. I have an answer to this, but it's it's not a fun one, Shoot. which is that being artists, being people who think like this and both experience and feel the human condition and the societal condition of the time and reflect that back. That's our job as artists, right? Oftentimes that means that artists get the uh, short straw, as it mm -hmm. were. The solution is that these systems have to change and be replaced by something that is bottom focused, that is ground mm -hmm. up, not top down, that is not focused on the extraction of wealth and rather focused on the building of people and community. So what I think I'm going to, I'm going to use kind of a, a buzzword that's being thrown around right now a lot, which is like divestment, but mm -hmm. the, the best form of, I want something different is non-reliance is saying, mm. you know what? I think that, and, and, and this is why I'm going to caveat. This is why it's a hard take because for artists who are already making beautiful art and are already struggling to pay bills and are already not getting paid for it to say, yes, you guys have to eat this bullet for the rest of society is an awful thing to say and to put on your back. So I, I apologize for saying this to you, to amazing artists right now. No need. But to say, I believe that what Live Nation doing is doing is so bad and so bad for industry, society, and artists I refuse to participate in that system. And I will only do shows at a club where it is friendly to these platforms that I care about or where they sell the tickets to people and there's no scalpers allowed or however, you know, we as a community decide like these are the these are the stepping stones to a better future. I think that that's how something like that's going to play out because these systems are so live nation is a monopoly. Absolutely. How, how do you fight that by in the system? If I'm still going to play at Jiffy yeah. Lube live or Nissan Pavilion, I, I never know mm -hmm. which it is like I have to play ball with them. So the only way to really say like, we're done with this system is to truly say no. Like I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going yeah. to, as a fan, attend shows there. I'm not going to, as an artist, play shows there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the problem with that is, and I absolutely understand where yeah. you're coming from. And I think in a perfect world, like that would ideally be the situation. Right. But the problem is that artists and major labels are not standing up for the community at all. In fact, they're actively dismantling it in a lot of ways. So I think until the situation becomes that our fans truly decide to boycott these companies and these performances at large, change won't happen because to put the impetus on smaller artists and limit their growth potential, I just don't see that being a sustainable no. way forward because that's only going to grow resentment in the community, mm. I think. And really the impetus has to be on fans caring enough about the music industry as a whole to want something better for themselves. And I think with the Taylor Swift era's tour, this has, conversation has finally come to the forefront where 
fans were fed up. They were fed up that they were getting $200 plus in quote processing fees for mm. quite literally just putting their credit card information onto a website. Yeah. What is there to process? Yeah. That transaction costs a company less than a dollar. Wow. There's no reason to have $200 worth of additional fees. And you can't go on to say it's going to pay someone's salary because this is all automated. So it's an issue that genuinely has to start with a mindset of, I won't support that, like you just said. But I think it has to come from the fans because as individual artists, I don't think we have any power if we're outside of the majors. I, I, I think you're so right. Jordy, you go. Go for I it. I think we do. And this is also something I've been thinking a lot about lately as an independent artist and like wanting to play more shows. I feel like the New York community of artists is very specifically thinking about this a lot. What they've been doing is building shows with their friends and like finding uh, like out of the ordinary venues and then bringing that equipment there. And I feel That's like awesome. in the same yeah. ways that we're looking for more authentic human experiences. I've gone to a lot of concerts in the past year and I'm not enjoying them as much as I used to for that exact reason. There's too many people, they're asking for too much money, the water bottles are $8. I feel like it's not fostering the kind of environment that we used to get from attending live shows it would be slowly and it would take some time and more artists would have to do it but for myself as an artist and things that i've been thinking about um is only having shows in smaller interesting locations exclusively and like i feel like even if i got a lot bigger I would want to do that because that's what's fun for me personally. And I also yeah. feel like it's better for the fans. And so to the extent where fans are paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars to be in this huge stadium and not really and get to see the artists, especially even the slightly smaller ones. I'm 5'3". The number of shows I've been to lately where I couldn't see a thing have been genuinely really upsetting. And I feel like if instead artists, instead of like, I would love it if a regular tour looked like instead of playing this big arena in this big city, and then three days later, this big stadium in the state over, if we just had like, okay, like Billie Eilish is going to be in New York and she's going to play at this these like three small places in Queens and these couple places in Brooklyn and it'll be more shows in a row I think what will happen is you probably won't get the same people coming to every single show because if you know she's gonna be there for a while yeah. you're like I'll make it to one and I'll enjoy it because it'll be smaller and it won't get crazy and there's only a certain amount of tickets and it's way harder to sneak into because it's not a stadium. It's just this one place. Um, and I feel like it would enrich the experience a lot more for everybody. I think we would be able to have a much better environment for that. And I think we're already on the way there. I think people just need to actually do it and they need to try it and see that it's profitable. Is really what it's it is. The one thing that I guess would need to be just a cultural shift is like the safety elements of an artist like Billie Eilish playing at a small venue, because I think that just raises so many more concerns when like someone is genuinely like ten feet from someone else mm -hmm. than being like, you know, thousands of feet away from someone else. So uh, I don't know. I guess that's something to be seen. Um, I have heard, I guess, stories of. For example, like Miley Cyrus sings exclusively basically at small venues as of late. Mm. She just does it for fun, not really for profit, just um, goes around to different places in L.A. and has like a small gathering of like intimate family and friends and things like that. Sometimes extra random people probably end up there. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of thing could work, but then I think the price point would be 10 times worse than it is now. Because it's like a tiny little listening room, so intimate, so exclusive, maybe an eighth or a tenth of the amount of tickets available between those seven shows, maybe in one city. And not only that, the additional workload on the artist to perform 
seven times in one place mm -hmm. instead of once um, and maybe doing a shorter set. So then you're maybe shortchanging fans in that way. And I hate to be a contrarian. I just mean for no. like a large artist, I just don't know if it would work. I think ultimately the issue lies within the monopolization of the large venues in this country. The fact that almost every single one operates through Ticketmaster and Live Nation, every stadium tour uh, has to go through them. And that's the problem. There hasn't been a tour from a major artist with a major label probably in the past five years that hasn't run through Live Nation, mm. maybe more, maybe longer. Absolutely. I have I have two thoughts to inject, which is one being Ed Sheeran, however you feel about him as a person or him as an artist, he did this for about three years. He toured and he toured like 250 days out of the years. So a lot of concerts. And he set a ticket price of like $30 for everybody. I didn't know that. I actually mm. really love him. That's cool. It was really cool. And it was extremely profitable. He made a lot of money. Uh, furthermore, there's been some people who have released like specials and stuff on Bandcamp and they've said, hey, this is free, but if you want to pay me, you can. And they have made yeah. more money than if they had charged for it. So mm -hmm. this, this model yeah. is possible. And then something I want to inject because as a community, we need to be thinking about this. In the same way that Live Nation and Ticketmaster need to be prevented from doing what they do, ticket scalpers, individual people oh, yeah. also need to be prevented to it. So mm -hmm. when you sell a ticket, you need to sell that ticket to an individual person. I'm not saying that they can't resell that ticket, but it does need to be so that if they have resold that ticket, they can't buy another. Mm -hmm. So mm. this is this is something that like we have to start thinking about as a as a community how we need to like authenticate who is actually buying our stuff. I agree. I think blockchain would be a good solution to that actually because it creates innate metadata for every transaction. Mm. So by using that essentially tickets would become like NFTs and you would be able to like know the entire transaction history of every single ticket ever sold. I think you're spot on with that. I think that is exactly where that's headed. <laughs> and it's, it is the only option It has soon. to. It's it the only to. way. It's yeah. the only way. So when that, when that becomes available, jump on it. Everybody, everybody just accept it. It's mm -hmm. here. And we're going to, and we're going to flash back to this episode and say you heard oh, it I here can't first. Wait. <laughs> That'll be great. Guys, this has been literally so much fun. I've just enjoyed every minute of this episode um, i love you both yeah. thank you so much for this time yeah, thank you Avery. this was so <laughs> fun i i would do this in a heartbeat you guys ask great questions i love and miss you both dearly so like to oh see my you God, absolutely. every talking about this is just like uh, so much fun like so oh. good thanks yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. This was the Jasmine or Tea Show with my lovely co host, Jordi Polycarp, and our wonderful guest, Aiden Smith. Hey guys, welcome back to the Jasmine or Tea Show. This is our final segment, our community corner, where we answer your questions and give you advice. All right. So, one question that I got was what are good strategies um, as an independent artist for marketing yourself without a team? And I feel like, I like this question because I feel like, I mean, kind of in the range of what we've been talking about with the way that music is being devalued and like, we're trying to find a place for ourselves as independent artists in society again. Um, I think that it's mostly just like having a consistent schedule. It feels like posting is really the only thing you can do when it's just you. Um, because like you can't really, or depending on what you have access to, you might not always have access to photo shoots and music videos and things like that. Um, and you try to try to find your community of friends that can help you out with this kind of stuff. But I feel like as long as you can get yourself on a schedule and stick to it of schedule of posting, schedule of making content, schedule of creating your artwork. Um, or creating your music, um, as long as you can kind of remember why it is you're doing what you're doing and treat it like it's a regular job, um, you have to have a schedule for it. I think that's the best strategy as an independent artist for me personally. Another thing that I would say is to 
go out to local shows. We've, we've been talking about this a lot, finding the community in the live music scene. Go out to shows, whether it's your style of music or not. Find other creatives, other musicians, DJs, music venues, promoters, concert bookers who are willing to hear you out, at least make a relationship with them and see where that takes you. I think the best sort of marketing when you don't have a team is to put yourself out there and to meet people because people are ultimately what drive success in art. So whether or not you have marketing dollars, so to speak, to promote social media posts or to make a music video, that can matter less and less if you're able to kind of guerrilla market yourself and really form a dedicated fan base in your home city. Mm -hmm. I also think in terms of um, like trying to network yourself, I think you need an elevator pitch. You need to understand who you are or like what you can offer as an artist because you can't just kind of network yourself as like, I'm a girl who makes music and that's it. Like, I think, I think it's a skill to be taught. Um, and that's something I didn't really learn until I was in school for it really. But if you don't know what you're about, it makes you like, it makes people want to talk to you less. You seem a little wishy-washy and like you won't really commit to this, even if you are. All right, I have one more question for us today. So this is about communication in relationships. What are some effective communication strategies for resolving conflicts in a relationship? This is interesting. I think mm. communication and conflict resolution are the most important factors of a healthy relationship. I know this because I've experienced healthy and unhealthy ways of doing this exact thing. For example, I used to try to people please and avoid conflict at all costs. I never wanted to bring up things that I had an issue with because I was afraid of being gaslit essentially um, by being told, no, that didn't happen. I didn't say this, I didn't say that because that's just how things were resolved in that particular relationship. So ultimately what ended up happening every time is I would bottle up these emotions and just let it kind of explode when it came to a break point not a good example of what to do. Do not do mm -hmm. that. Do not people please, especially when it's to your own detriment. Um, there's one thing, you know, being malleable or able to compromise in a group setting. That's different than people pleasing in your relationship. So that being said, I think a healthy way to do that instead would be to be super upfront, direct and blunt about what's going on why and how you feel that way in the most non-dramatic way possible. Not to shield your emotions if you're genuinely feeling like crying, be honest about that, but don't mm. hyperbolize something that could have been addressed at the start just because you waited weeks or months to address it, especially if your partner is receptive to that sort of open communication. I think the best thing that you can do is decide to put your ego away and as much as you can have your boundaries and, you know, want to protect yourself and things like that, which is also super important, if you can just kind of think about it, not entirely from your perspective, but just kind of as a whole, if you can see it almost like an aerial view of the situation, I feel like that's the best thing. Because loving somebody means being able to not just put yourself in their shoes, but just kind of like remove your agenda out of the equation kind of in the same way that we say that regular conversation can't really happen if each person is just waiting for the other person to finish talking so they can say their point I think the same is true for relationships and we kind of need to be able to put the, that part of our brain away a little bit and have a little bit of humility and think okay like I love this person I want this to work out I want us to be able to talk and like a healthy way and a productive way so let me just decide to dial it back a little bit um and i think as as someone who has not been in many relationships but as that as a strategy has really been the only thing that's worked for me all right guys thank you so much for tuning in this week we'll see you next week remember to keep it jasmine